Welcome to the weekly podcast of First United Methodist Church in Costa Mesa, California. Founded in 1912, the church gathers on Sundays at 10 a.m., and we invite you to join us anytime. For more information, visit our website, costamesafirstumc.com, or connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. The reading from Scripture is from the middle of the Old Testament, it's the Psalm section, uh, Psalms. And many of them start with some instructions. It's just a little bit of instruction here. Praise for God's goodness to Israel. To the leader, a song, a psalm. Make a joyful noise to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Give to him glorious praise. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. Because of your great power, your enemies cringe before you. All the earth worships you. They sing praises to you, sing praises to your name. Come and see what God has done. He is awesome in his deeds among mortals. He turns the sea into dry land. They pass through the, through the river on foot. There we rejoiced in him who rules by his might forever, whose eyes keep watch on the nations. Let the rebellious not exalt themselves. Bless our God, O peoples, and the sound of his praise be heard. Who has kept us among the living and has not let our feet slip? For you, O God, have tested us. You have tried us as silver is tried. You brought us into the net. You laid burdensome on our backs. You let people ride over our heads. We went through fire and through water. Yet you have brought us out to a spacious place. I will come into your house with burnt offerings. I will pay you my vows. Those that my lips uttered and my mouth promised when I was in trouble. I will offer to you burnt offerings of fatlings with the smoke of the sacrificed rams. I will make an offering of of bulls and goats. Come and hear all you who fear God, and I will tell you what he has done for me. I cried aloud to him, and he was extolled with my tongue. If I had cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. But truly God has listened. He has given heed to the words of my prayer. Blessed be God, because he has not rejected my prayer or removed his steadfast love from me. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Um, thank you so much. That was a long but beautiful reading. So thank you very much, Bob. So we have been, and this is our final week in a series about kind of what does it mean to pray using the Psalms? And, and more than that, like what do the Psalms help us do? And so we've been talking about how we often in life feel lost. And if you're not in that moment, don't worry, it's coming. Even as Alex shared earlier, this new experience for her mom of trying to decide where a parent goes, we all have these things that come along in life where we feel like we're unsure which way to go, which path to take. And when we experience these moments of feeling lost, sometimes we don't know what to do, how we are to act, what we need to be or feel in these moments. And when we're actually lost, it can feel that way. I joke around that kids who are younger will never feel lost because they always have it on their phone. But the truth is, that isn't even helpful. I was in LA recently with friends trying to get to a place called Earth Cafe, but apparently the buildings were not letting the GPS uh, quite work. And so if you could have seen us just circling, um, trying to find the correct place, right? We don't, we don't, miss out on feeling lost. Everyone is going to experience feeling lost. 
So we've been using this sort of as a, as a metaphor of the ways that we can look at prayer and the ways that we can look at psalms. As Bob mentioned earlier, psalms really are songs or kind of prayers written out in song form. And we've been talking about the wonderful work of Walter Brueggemann, if you ever get a chance to check out his writing on these. He says there's three different kinds of psalms. There's psalms of orientation, of focus, knowing exactly you know who and what and why or at least being in awe of God. And we talked about sometimes prayer looks like that, and sometimes those are great psalms, right? The like victorious psalms of like, you have brought me out of this, everything is great. And sometimes that's how life can feel, right? We can feel like I am oriented towards the right thing. I am doing nothing but win. And then we talked about the moments of disorientation, where even though you were pretty sure you were headed in the right direction, you hit some sort of a change, things move, and all of a sudden you feel like where you once thought you were going, you are no longer going, and often that leads us to lament. We talked about that last week. Thank you so much to folks who have reached out and said that was a sermon that meant a lot to you. That was hard to do to talk about how even scripture, Psalm 88, does not end on a high note. It ends with the person continuing to feel abandoned. And sometimes in our own faith structures and cultures and communities, we have somehow given the idea that if you are faithful, you will never experience feeling disoriented. You will never feel as though God is not near. And then we come to those moments and it happens and we feel like the whole thing doesn't work anymore. We talk about that sometimes in this community as deconstruction. So what are we to do? So last week we talked about how it's part of it. Disorientation can feel like death. But today we're going to talk about reorientation, resurrection, or what can often feel like new birth and new life. So let us pray and then we're going to jump into this psalm. God, as always, I simply ask this. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of us here gathered in this space or online be acceptable to you because, God, you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I love psalms because they are written by actual humans who are having actual human experiences. I love the idea that it isn't people from like afar kind of being like, yeah, this is what's happening. Instead, it's people who are going through the day-to-day experience of being a human, both the joys, the loss, the excitements, the fears, the hopes, all of that is happening. What kind of can be problematic is that people will take lines from Psalms and, you know, like college Sarah used to have one that like scrolled across her screen and I was like, that's what God is, right? But no, that's what someone was experienced God as in that moment. I had this wonderful quote about how God was there for the brokenhearted, which is beautiful and wonderful and true. And I'm really surprised that I didn't have like one of the things from Psalm 88, like, where are you, God? Like, how sad would you see that scrolling across someone's screen? But we've all been there and felt that. The difficult thing is when our faith communities don't allow space for that. I was reading an article by Dr. Pete Enns, who I just enjoy his writing so much and his podcast, but he was actually quoting Walter Brueggemann uh, as he said this, church should be the most honest place in town, not the happiest place in town. Sometimes when we only look at the happy, good, and easy things, we become sort of like a self-help Tony Robbins, this is great, let's cheer and like go out into the world and do your best, live your best life, YOLO. But churches like that are not honest. It should be a place where people's stories are welcome. Just like the psalm, they're they're kind of welcoming all different life experiences, and that's important. So if we're going to be a place of honesty, then we have to be a place that is honest about why we pray and how we pray. And if we look at this 
This wonderful psalm we just read, 66, doesn't it look like the stereotypical view of prayer? Like, God, we cried out to you, and then you like met us in our hardship, and you gave us all the good stuff, and it's like this rally cry of like, you care about our nation, and it's this wonderful thing, until you think about like, actually, the guy who is writing that, I'm going to say guy, girl, I'm not sure which, the human that is writing this, is writing all these things that have happened to Israel, and it's after all these things have happened to Israel. And what we need to notice is that all the things that happened to Israel weren't actually great. They turned out great, but in the moment, they didn't feel great. Going to Egypt meant entering into slavery. Going into the story of the desert is people feeling lost, unsure where God is. All of these things that he's saying, like, you have done all these great things. We have to remember that, yes, it might sound like he's talking to a Santa Claus version of God. And my gosh, do I not wish that was true. Right? Like, if you pray and you pray in the right way and you say enough in your wills, then the thing that you're hoping for will turn out. But again, we know that that doesn't necessarily ring true. And Israel in this is not actually getting what Israel wanted. There is more to this psalm. It's not simply a call and response. God, I call out to you. I can't wait for your response. This psalm is written to a people who have gone through pain. None of the things they have experienced have felt good. And can't we relate? I was recently on my way to somewhere in LA. And I was crazy enough to believe that the traffic that was when I left Orange County was going to be the traffic that I would experience in LA. And if you have Waze or you use Google, which I can't use Google because I think it's trying to kill me, but whatever, it might maps, right? All of a sudden, the traffic built up. And on Fridays, I go to this um, class that I take in LA, and so I was on my way there, and it's a very, there's only six of us in this group, and I don't want to be late because I am Canadian, and we don't believe in being late, and so, because that's rude and might offend someone else, and so I was really like, I got to get there on time, and if you know me, when I'm not on time, I'm very anxious, but here was the problem. I also hadn't eaten. I know someone in here knows me really well because they went, oh no, right? Yes, when I don't eat, I turn hangry, like not in cute ways at all. And so I was, I need to eat, but I also need to get to this thing. So here I am, and I'm like talking to God. I'm like, not today. I've got to get there, and I'm getting kind of worried, and then people are cutting me off. You ever notice the worst humans start driving when you're late? And it's like, I'm not going to lose my faith. And then I saw McDonald's, which only matters because they have the best iced tea. So I like pulled over and I was going to go get McDonald's. But the guy in front of me was ordering for his entire office. Also, while checking his Facebook in the drive through line. I rolled my window down to make an order. And I might have also said, really like just like really passive aggressively or I guess that was aggressive aggressively but I just was like how can you not see that I'm running late so I'm texting everyone I'm gonna try to get there on time and I run in the door and I'm having one of these like ah and this group that I belong to is a a group of female entrepreneurs they're the greatest smartest humans you've ever met and we're in this room and there's this girl in our group named Crystal and Crystal is African-American she is incredible she runs her own skincare line and she's a psychotherapist so You should feel bad about yourself, guys. She's killing it. Um, Maybe it's just me. Uh, But when I'm in there, I come running in, and I'm like, I'm so sorry. I'm late. Nobody looks concerned or angry with me. And I said, I'm really sorry I'm late. I had all this. I'm giving all these excuses. And Crystal says this. I wonder what God was preventing you from having to experience by you being late. What? That's not ever how I think. And although sometimes I'm like, no, theology, that's not quite move. I was like, oh, maybe, right? She's like, I mean, there were a lot of car wrecks. Maybe you would have been in it. And then my head's like, but what about the people that were? But beside the point, to stop and think, maybe there was something that I wasn't 
aware of. When we pray, oftentimes we will pray in a way that almost becomes transactional. I wanted this. I asked for that. That's not what happens. And then we think about the verse. Maybe what I was experiencing is that Luke 11, 11, which of your fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? When I think about my disappointments with the divine, it's often because I have leaned into really wishing that transactional God was real. The one where I could just cosmically Santa Claus, this is my list. Um, if you could just sort of do that, that'd be, this is my list. Clearly you're not reading my list. I'll write it a different way. Oh, if I write it three times, maybe you'll get it. Um, God, let me just explain to you one more time why what I would like, I would think would be best for everyone. I might have prayed that this morning with Bruce because we found a lottery ticket in the parking lot. And your pastor said these words, what if this wins us millions and we can pay off all our debts and then we can make a movie about it? Because, and he was, you know, I was hoping, wasn't I? A little bit of a prayer. (laughs) My friend Brian, who also is doing this series with his church in Kailua, he wrote this, their hope and prayer is the same as our hope in difficult situations. It's for God to fix the situation, to solve the problem, but God does not solve problems. Ouch. God does not merely bring us back into the same place from which we came. God instead responds. God transforms. God makes us new. With every hardship, every dark night, comes not what we would have expected or hoped to happen, the fix to the problem, but instead the potential for growth, to learn, to deepen our appreciation for God's love. but I really, really wanted. Have you ever had that moment with the divine where you turn into a small child? But I wanted it this way. When we think about the idea of reorientation, and we read this scripture, the end of it, I think, holds so much for us. The gift of prayer is not the gift of maybe necessarily getting the gift that we wanted or hoped for, but instead, these last couple of verses, the gift of being heard and the gift of being loved. Blessed be God, because he has not rejected my prayer or removed his steadfast love from me. He has not rejected my prayer. I want to share with you a season of my life that was the worst part of my life. I've gone through a lot for a human. I'm going to say who's not that old, but I'm getting to the middle, guys. Um, and I, it was 2012. I had lost all, um, everything I thought I was hoping for, everything I had prayed for. I was getting married and then didn't. That was really hard. I was starting a new job. I was, all these things were happening in my life. And it felt like I really wanted that transactional God to be true. And so I started meeting with a prayer team and this group of people and I would tell them what was going on with me and we would pray together and I was just like this is I cannot wait for God to fix all of these things because imagine how good my sermons would be imagine my stories of victory once all of these things that once had been so difficult were going to just sunny and everything was going to be great but it felt more and more Like when I prayed, the opposite happened. So in the midst of this, I stopped praying. Almost as if I didn't want God to know my deepest desires because what if God hears that, then he's going to flip it. And by the way, he was probably the word I would have used for God back then. If if I reveal my deepest needs, is God going to take it away from me? So I stopped praying which is not something that pastors usually admit. My heart felt rejected. My prayers felt more than rejected. And I lost God. Now, not the divine. I didn't lose God, but I lost the transactional God that I thought wanted to give me every good and perfect gift, not understanding exactly what I was hoping for was not exactly maybe what I even needed or wanted 
It reminds me of a song, I hate to admit that I know, but from Garth Brooks, Thank God for Unanswered Prayers. I had been praying so hard for different parts of my life to turn around, and when they didn't, I realized that that wasn't how God and I were going to do business, which is interesting because that's not ever how God and I have done business, but in that season, oh, in that moment of feeling disoriented. So I lost the transactional God. I lost that way of praying, but what did I gain? Well, it was in that season that I started a list of gratitude. In fact, funnily enough, when I was working on this sermon and my taxes, you're welcome, Tuesday was eight. You should have just hung out with me all day. I was having a great time. I was working on my taxes, and this journal fell out from the top of the like, cabinet, and it was um, my prayer journal, but it wasn't a prayer journal. The year before it had been a prayer journal. This year, instead, it was a gratitude list. And if you know me really well, you know I have kept that practice of lists of gratitude. So I gained that. I also gained reading scripture like a prayer, including the Psalms, because I didn't know how to give words to what I wanted or needed. I also gained a practice of meditation, which I am not great at, friends, but I continue to work at, and apparently you're not supposed to say you're not great at it. What was interesting is I slowly realized that my prayer life was becoming more and more part of just every day. It wasn't talking to God in the same way of like, God, here is my list of demands. Also, I'm really happy that you're so great, right? I had like a way that I used to do it, but instead it started to seem more and more like praying without ceasing. A constant conversation no longer transactional. I would say I lost that God, but I am learning more and more about the God of scriptures and the God of creation and the God of radical honesty. Sometimes it's hard because I miss that like idea, right? Like, oh, I wish that was true. But how much more lovely is it to be learning about a God that is going to shape things, not in the way that looks like how I want them to be shaped, but instead in a way that brings fullness, not just to me, but to others. As we head into next week, as we start with Ash Wednesday, it's going to be a season of radical honesty and patterning our lives differently. It's a reorientation. And I think sometimes whether we feel lost or not on the path, it's helpful to remind us what path we're on. Friends, I know it can feel like everything isn't working out. And sometimes maybe that's kind of true. But what would it look like to allow God to reorient how we feel about those times and spaces? I'm going to invite our incredible band forward, and they're going to play a song from a series we did. Um, I don't know if you remember we did a song. I'm making them do a Mumford and Sons song, but I would like to point out that Quentin suggested we do this. Everyone remember that because he doesn't like Mumford and Sons. But we did this song because the words are so powerful. It's, a, it's this idea of like, I don't even know what I believe, but I know that I want to believe, and I know that I want to hear you. And I think that's what reorientation is about. So in these moments, I would like for us to just sit and enjoy the music. If you want to sing with him, great. If you want to just sit and think about like, where are the places where you want to see where the path is going? How can you be with God in ways that might be different than it used to be? How can you grieve the spaces and places of who you once thought God was and yet be open to who God really is? If you are a parent of a little one, we ask that you go get your little one so that they can sing the final song with us. But let us enter into this time of just reflection and thought.